This is the Mining Your Own Business podcast, brought to you by Elder Research. Each episode will bring in data and analytics gurus from around the world as they regale us with their data analytics stories and enlighten us with their secrets for how to turn data into actionable insights. Now, here's our host, Evan Wimpy, who will guide us as we dare to mine our own business. Welcome to the Mining Your Own Business podcast. I'm your host, Evan Wimpy, and I'm excited today to introduce Olga Sazanova. Olga is the Director of Data Science and Analytics at Nutrisense. There she leads a team of analysts and engineers, and they focus on Nutrisense's promise, which is delivering a personalized nutrition and wellness and disease prevention. Her, Olga's background's in biological data science. She's previously worked at Grail and 23andMe. She's got a PhD in biomedical engineering from Boston University, and we're excited to have her on the show. Oh, Olga, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Evan, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Sure. Yeah, and that was uh, touched the surface, but maybe can you give us a little bit of background where you got from your biological background to, to where you are now in data and analytics and the current role that you have at, at Nutrisense? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so I started my interest in science very young when I was even all the way back to high school and science fair program that got me really excited about wanting to understand how biological systems work. Um, and I pursued a PhD in biomedical engineering, but most of that work was actually at the bench. And I didn't start becoming what is now called a data scientist until the end of my PhD, where I wanted more sophisticated ways to analyze the data that I was collecting. And that really um, convinced me that these uh, computational approaches are very useful in science. And that's why I pursued a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship in computational genomics. So that was kind of, you know, the early, the early evolution. And at some point I realized I didn't want to be in academia. I entered industry as a um, computational biologist working mostly with genomic data. So spent a number of years at 23andMe working on risk prediction and how we can use a person's DNA to assess whether they are at higher risk of developing a particular disease. Um, worked at Grail looking at a blood-based cancer detection, also using both a DNA signal floating in the blood and proteins that are floating in the blood that may be derived from a tumor. And at, you know, one thing that I loved at 23andMe was working for a direct consumer product. And that was something that I missed once I left. I really liked taking complicated biological signal, turning it into something meaningful that a consumer can derive value from and be delighted by. So when I was looking for the next chapter in my career, that was really what I was looking for. I was excited to be in a smaller startup. I was excited to be in a role that would touch many aspects of the business rather than focusing on something that's very much a research project. Um, and I, for me, you know, the CGM space was, was up and coming. This idea that we can take a tool that was previously for sick people, you know, acceptable to use if you're a diabetic. Um, and But now we want to deliver the value of the same tool to everyone. That story really appealed to me. Um, and so it was kind of a perfect synergy uh, that I found myself at NutriSense where I get to think about interesting biological questions. I get to think about making a direct consumer product based on uh, biomedical data. And of course, there's the business intelligence and analytics to help us grow as a company that is relatively new for me as a domain. And I'm getting a lot of knowledge in, in this role. Awesome. Yeah, that's very exciting. And it sounds like a, a place and a role that is very well suited to your background. Um, I, I am curious. I, I'm not sure how, how old Nutrisense is. You mentioned startup. It's been around at least a little while now. My impression is that... Go ahead. I was going to say the company started just a few months before COVID. So they're not... We're, oh, we're pretty young. Perfect timing. Pretty young. Yeah. Well. Okay. All right. I, and I take it they... It, they generate a lot of, or they collect a lot of data and the sort of purport to help give that real personalized wellness information. So they're no stranger to analytics. They're sort of almost built for analytics. Is that, do, do you find that to be the case? Are they, do they feel analytically ready or maybe more data appreciative uh, than, than previous places that you've been? Mm. I think there are a couple of questions built into that, so let me unpack it. Uh, what we offer 
our members is their own data. We offer a way to detect something that is otherwise very difficult and, and frankly painful. I don't know if you've pricked your finger much, but it's totally unfun. Difficult and painful to track. Um, and, and we offer, in addition to that, uh, dietitian support that can help people get the most out of that data. So it's very much, a, we are a data-driven company because the product we're offering, really the value is data for you to understand yourself and better understand your metabolism. Um, but we kind of add an additional abstraction um, and benefit of the interpretation that um, anyone can work with a dietitian to get. So yes, um, by virtue of that being our core product, we are a very data-driven company. Uh, we, of course, from day one, are, have been collecting data from the CGMs that people are using, but we are also very data-driven in our marketing, in our operations. We, because members work, most of our members work with registered dietitians, Dietitians need some information about the, these people's well-being to do a good job of guiding them. Um, so in addition to the food logs that our members often keep, um, by working with a registered dietitian, we'll end up learning more and more about someone's health through the data they volunteer to get the most out of that relationship. So we have questionnaires on people's health. Um, I think, you know, this is a much richer subject, but the interactions between members and dietitians can reveal many, many interesting insights about a person's lifestyle habits, their, um, you know, their well-being overall, how they respond to various modifications of their lifestyle, and so forth. Yeah, that's that's very exciting. I, I from the little I know about NutriSense, it's CGM, it's continuous glucose monitoring. But yeah, mm -hmm. certainly as a nutritionist, that's not the only piece of data that you want. So maybe we can just talk a little bit more about the types of data that's offered. And when you mention like the conversations or, or the interactions that they have with nutritionists, I think, is there an opportunity? Is there, is there text or, or speech there that you can process or try to analyze? Absolutely. So from a data scientist perspective, this is very exciting to me because all the interactions are through text and they are captured in our app. And so we are developing probably the richest corpus in the world of interactions between dietitians and uh, the general population. And you can segment that population however you want. We work with individuals who have a type two diabetes diagnosis. We also work with people who are pre-diabetic. We work with many people who have no indications. And on the other end of that spectrum, we work with people who are very, very, very fit and who are using our product to optimize their fitness to levels beyond which I could ever aspire to. <laughs> so the fact that all of this happens not through uh, you know, a Zoom call, but through text is a really incredible opportunity to learn um, you know, how these interactions unfold, what value a dietitian can really bring, um, how the complexity of the conversations uh, into, uh, impacts the outcomes that the member experiences. You know, that's a hypothesis. That's something we haven't tested but are very interested in. So there's really, um, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with that data. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. That's certainly a lot of data that you have on folks. And I, I want to ask you about, so I, I think on your team, you've got both analysts and you have engineers as well. Can you talk maybe a little bit about the challenge of having all of this data and particularly the, the street, I don't know if it's streaming data or if it's processed in batch, but you've got a lot of data that comes in just from the CGM on folks. Yeah. So are there challenges associated with that? Well, I, I think we benefit from the fact that uh, even though our data set is impressive, um, I would say that you know, Netflix and Amazon have had to solve much bigger data collection problems than we have. And so best practices exist for a lot of what we need to do. You know, certainly building these systems from the ground is non-trivial, but um, I don't think that our CGM technology creates any unique difficulties for the kind of 
upstream of the analytics work, you know, to collect the data, to pipe it in. Now, we have a very broad range of data sources, and I think that is certainly keeping us busy in terms of uh, having integrations for all the different kinds of things we measure. I mean, you know, we measure all the standard marketing analytics on ad spend and clicks, and we measure how people interact with our website. And at the same time, we measure every event that happens in our app where a user opens the app and they tap here and they tap there and how long they see any given feature. Um, so I would say that the breadth of that is perhaps as challenging to wrangle as the amount of data. Now, you know, ask me in a year when <laughs> we have grown our user base by many fold and I may tell you a different story. Um, and of course, as I said before, you know, we're pretty young in terms of um, the age of the company. Um, so the challenges will change. I'm certain of that. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. I, I'm curious for the, so you mentioned a couple of times you've got sort of your health and wellness related data, and then you have your traditional data that any, any business faces, mm -hmm. sales, marketing, financial data, mm -hmm. and your, your team oversees analytics for, for both of those. Is, is there yeah. a clear line or are these, these, the analysts that have biological background and, and they focus on health and wellness mm -hmm. and these folks are sales and marketing types folks? We're not that differentiated at this age, you know, at this stage of the company and the team. We need everyone to wear the hats. My background is obviously very um, biological, biomedical. I'm most comfortable in like a research space. Um, so I, I've been looking to build a team with skill sets that complement that, where, you know, I can provide guidance on how to design a research study, how to adequately test certain hypotheses, the statistical methods we'd want to use. And I get to partner with people who can provide me guidance on the best way to transform data in, in from an, you know an unstructured source so that it can sit in this relational database and be accessible through these downstream tools and so forth. Um, so, you know, is are we differentiated in terms of this analyst works on this type of problem and that type of problem? No, but do we bring complementary skill sets? Yes, and we need to in order to execute on the very broad range of problems that we need to solve. Yeah, I think I think that's perfect. There's not just the data scientist who knows the mm -hmm. data science skills. There we go. The background certainly is important. Yeah. So a, a common challenge that we talk about on the show, and and it's not that you're the first guest we've had to talk about in in health and wellness data, but it's trying to get some insights, some analytics to drive real change from somebody. So like in the retail space or the manufacturing space, it's changing the way they do business. I'm curious if the analogy for your role, you've got a nutritionist who's offering health and wellness advice to folks. You're analyzing a lot of the same data that, that they have and they see. Do you is is the is a nutritionist sort of your your end user that you're trying to to help influence or help help give them insights that the data is is telling you? No, you know the dietitians, the re our registered dietitian team is part of the service that we offer to our members, but our our fundamental focus is on everyday consumers who are interested in learning more about their metabolism, or they have some concerns because metabolic disease runs in their family, or they have been diagnosed, and they want to make a change, and we are offering them the combination of real-time insight into their own metabolism and an expert to help them make the most of that data in order to help them achieve change in their life. So yeah, we are also chasing change. We're chasing behavior change. Certainly. And from my perspective, you know, Working at 23andMe, the goal is very similar. The hope was that if we teach people about their genetic risk and tell them what, what they can do to mitigate that risk, they will be motivated by that information to do it. And the truth is that some people are, but a lot of people are not. Um, you know, it, it's very abstract. If I tell you that in 30 years, your risk of getting X disease is 50% higher than mine, but the actual risk across the entire population is 2%, what do you do with that? But if I tell you, hey, you just ate a cupcake and here's what happened to your blood sugar, 
The next time you eat a cupcake, eat some cheese first because we know that a combination of protein and fat can help you blunt that response. I've just given you very personalized insights about you that matter today, not in the future. And I've given you something very actionable to follow it up on. I think that's a very powerful tool for behavior change. And together with a dietitian who can <laughs> give you a much more, I'd say, nuanced explanation of what I just said, um, that's really, I think, the, the winning combination of resources that we want to give uh, everybody who you know, joins us for our programs. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I think you hit the nail on the head. You want the output that you provide to be decisionable, to be actionable by somebody. Exactly. And so exactly. Being, being clear and immediate is good. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not hoping this is the case, but certainly in other industries, it's been the case where sort of the, the industry expert or the, the dietitian may have a different viewpoint than what the, the data and analytics can come up with. Has, have you noticed or has there been a case where there's been any, any conflict where... The dietitian says, "No, no, no! Don't, don't do, don't do what the mm. the data is spitting out." Well, one of the strategies that NutriSense took very early on is to build a team of dietitians and nutrition professionals who are going to be trained on the technology we use, who are not going to necessarily be wedded to the traditional models and 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 school of thought in dietetics, but are going to be very open to um, being data-driven. And our team even has a mantra of data over dogma. And I think so wow. within our company, um, we're very aligned on the idea that you want to practice um, a holistic approach to someone's well-being. Uh, so the CGM alone is not the answer. But the CGM alone does give very uniquely useful insight. And if what you see in the data goes against what you know, you've been taught in, in, in your you know, degree program, uh, follow the data, you know, understand what may cause those conflicts and don't necessarily dismiss it. So a very personal example, I've been running these experiments on myself where I practice intermittent fasting and then I've been deliberately breaking my fast with dates. Now, Dates are very, very sweet, but they're also traditionally thought of as a great breakfast food. And people with diabetes are even encouraged to consume dates in favor of, you know, other forms of sugar. So I was curious to see, okay, what will dates do? Um, and I learned that they indeed make my blood sugar spike as badly as if I had eaten that cupcake. So there's one myth out the door, at least for me personally, um, that this is a good breakfast option. Um, and then I had a lot of fun trying to modulate that, that glucose spike with, by eating different foods together with the dates or different sequences. And I was working with my dietitian the whole time to understand, like, you know, why didn't dates with butter work? So good. I, I can't even <laughs> express to you, Evan, how much joy I got out of that experiment. It's like the most delicious thing. But it didn't help at all. Um, well, it could be because... Fat alone isn't enough for Olga to blunt that sugar response. Maybe Olga needs more protein. And so we ran those experiments. The point I'm trying to make is that I found our dietitians to be very aware of the value of the data, but also kind of open to learning with the members as they go, um, as well as relying on the great body of literature that exists around, around these things. Yeah. Uh, that's that's perfect, and that's that's I think a partnership that most folks would strive for, uh, leading up a data and analytics team for the people that they work with. They're sort of business partners there. They are accepting and want to work with the 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 data folks, the data and Absolutely. analytics folks. Absolutely. Okay, so you mentioned experiments a couple of times, and you know. A lot of things in data, you know, certainly one data point we don't want to draw a lot of inferences from is does that translate to to glucose monitoring as well? Like if you've if you tried dates with butter and you got this result, is it reasonable to expect that result all of the time or is more data better? And you can see mm. there's there's sort of probabilistic there. Mm -hmm. um, so for me. If I ate dates with butter three times in a row, should it, like what would happen? Would I expect the same result? Um, I think for every individual, there are so many other factors that go in to uh, 
impacting the impact of uh, impacting the result of a given meal, that it would be wrong to expect the same result every time. For example, if I slept six hours versus eight hours on a given night, I should see a different response to those dates. Um, female hormone cycles influence our metabolism significantly. So I think to get an accurate picture of what dates with butter, how dates with butter impact my metabolism, I should repeat the experiment and under different conditions. I will tell you though, honestly, that can be pretty tiring, you know, having to come up with the space of all the different experiments one might do. And this is where I think being a scientist, you know, I make my own life harder than it probably needs to be. Um, and I can get a, a pretty good approximation without being so rigorous. Um, but I think the other, the other element of your question, like, does that mean that Evan eating butter with dates should expect no benefit from the butter? And the answer is no. And this is one kind of um, amazing application of, of uh, continuous glucose monitor is that we really are seeing evidence of unique postprandial, you know, post-meal responses to the um, carbon sugar intake. And so uh, what p part of the value premise of our company and our product is like, you should learn, you should go out and take this tool and learn, you know, for you, is it brown rice or white rice that seems to be worse? We're all taught that brown rice is the best for me personally, I seem to spike more with brown rice, which is totally blowing my mind, but the data are undeniable. And yeah, I've repeated that experiment and it's still consistent, so go figure. Yeah, that's uh, that's really exciting. It's good to know. And it's good to know as a consumer, you know, if I were if I were a customer, I can uh, want to be really sure about the cookies and the ice cream and the dates with butter. So I'm going to repeat a lot of experiments with those just, <laughs> yeah. just to be sure. Just in case. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, but the same meal eaten four hours later in the day can also have a different impact because our insulin sensitivity changes just with circadian rhythms. So your body's response to the same input will be different because you're closer to your sleep cycle or not. Yeah, that very fair. And I think that's probably intuitive for a lot of people and it's good to get the data behind it to make, make the best decisions that we can. That's right. So, Olga, I want to ask you one last question. So you've got a pretty rich background in the sciences. You've been here for a little while now. If you could choose any type of, maybe maybe not experiment, but any type of effort that you wanted mm -hmm. to try to dig deeper and uncover something important, sort of not known or there's not enough time or resource on it now, where would you like to put, and assuming that all the dietitians and everybody at NutriSense is on board to your vision you get to pursue whatever you'd like and, and point your team to pursue whatever you'd like. Is there, is there a burning question that you'd go after? You know, there is one question for me and it's a question for, I think other people in the space who are being really honest with themselves. It's a question I, when I started this role, when I was contemplating starting this role and it's still an open question. And the question is for healthy people who don't have any signs of metabolic dysregulation, is this actually going to benefit me in the long run? I may delight in learning more about myself um, and I may change my behavior somewhat, like I'm not going to break my fast with dates, but am I actually better off? Like, is my lifespan going to extend? Am I going to reduce my risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, et cetera? Um, and that's, you know, that's no secret that the field doesn't know this, that if you go to your doctor and say, I'm healthy, should I wear a CGM? They'll say, well, I don't know. I don't, no one's proven the benefit. So I think NutriSense and every other company in this space, that's our biggest mission. If our goal really is to help people improve their health and well-being, we need to prove that the tools we're offering actually accomplish this. And I think we can all bring anecdotal evidence to support that claim. But until you've done the right experiments and the right trials, you know, the right studies, um, they're just claims. So I think, you know, there's a question of what's good for the business and there's a question of what's good for society. They don't always align. And I think once NutriSense is in a more mature place, um, I would love to tackle that question head on. Um, and then, of course, we can take a step even further back and say, uh, well, some of us are very healthy today, but we're going to get less healthy in specific ways over time. And that's where the genetic prediction can help, too. So find the people who are most at risk of developing, um, you know, early onset diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Give them a CGM. 
show that it's a great behavioral change tool that teaches them how to prevent the onset of the disease they're at risk for. And I think proving that that could work would really just change the paradigm dramatically. And that gets me very excited. What an, what an exciting space to be in. What an exciting problem to be working on. Olga, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been very insightful. Well, thank you, Evan. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. All right. Folks, if you're interested in working in the space, check out NutriSense. If you're interested in helping generate more data, then be a NutriSense customer and, and get, your, get your glucose monitored. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, then like and subscribe and catch the next episode of Mining Your Own Business. Olga, thanks so much.